speaking in English, which is uh, okay because uh, there are uh, students that uh, are uh, English uh, speakers, you have to do it this way. So I want to thank, first of all, Anna and the, uh, and the colleague that is there for, for having invited me and uh, being present, which is uh, <laughs> even nicer than uh, simply inviting. And the, well, and the topic uh, is inequality. So the, my, my basic message is uh, inequality is now a hot issue. We all know about the Piketty capital in the 20th, 21st century. We all know about uh, current discussions on inequality by economists, uh, and this seems to be a new development. What uh, I mean to, to tell you is that uh, don't be fooled, these are, uh, these are all discussions in, in economics, in political economy, and uh, much of what is being now presented as a novelty has in fact a very long uh, beards, and I want to show you those, uh, those long beards, those old beards. Um, and for the title, which is, by the way, invisible in the, uh, I have a PowerPoint in my laptop, but no imaging in the room. It's strange. many codes in this presentation, so I'll try to go slowly through these codes in order to make it uh, not so boring. Well, the thing is, I just want to start by recalling what, uh, at least those of us who, come, who came from uh, economics uh, background, were taught about equality in the uh, basic courses. So I just picked an author, Arthur Alcorn, not so well known, but in fact influential in shaping the idea that uh, we have equity or equality, doesn't matter much, and efficiency, different values, equality on the one hand, efficiency.
efficiency on the other hand. Both values are important, <coughs> although the economists, at least the type of economists who has written books about welfare economics, cares most about uh, efficiency, but nevertheless recognizes equality or equity as an important value. The basic idea is that uh, we most often we cannot have both at the same time. If we want uh, more equality, we have to give, give up something on the other value, which is efficiency. There is a trade-off between the two values. So, and this is the received view we have about this uh, trade-off. Okun uh, refers to the American society in the, in the 70s, and he, and he writes that the contrast among American fam families, both in living standards and in material wealth, reflect a system of rewards and penalties that is intended to encourage effort and channel it into the social productive activity. To the extent that the system succeeds, in, it generates an efficient economy. And if we deal properly with incentives, uh, we will have uh, an efficient economy. But the pursuit of efficiency necessarily creates inequality. And then society faces a trade-off between equality and efficiency. And it, is, it, describes, it describes this uh, trade-off between efficiency and equality with a metaphor, with a story. So imagine, imagine we have, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, water which has to be taken from a, a large uh, deposit, the deposit of the rich, to a smaller deposit which is the deposit of the poor, it has to be transported in a bucket. So in order to reach equality, we have to take water with a bucket from the deposit of the rich people and pour this water in the deposit of the smaller deposit of the poor people. But the problem is that the uh, is that the, the bucket the, the bucket is is leaking water in, during the transportation so the water which is taken from the deposit of the rich does not reach the deposit of the poor because the, the bucket is leak, is leaking water the money must be carried from the rich to the poor in a leaky bucket some of it will simply disappear in transit so the poor will not receive all the money that is taken from the rich. So efficiency, there is a loss in efficiency when you try to transport water from the deposit of the rich to the deposit of the poor. How comes, I should ask the economist as a straightforward answer to the why is the bucket leaking? Every economist should know this. Of course, it's an incentive problem. It's an incentive problem because uh, well, because the poor will reduce their disposition to work when they, receive, when they receive transfers, when they receive simply a sum which is transferred without, a, without any work or labor being given in return. So the, the poor would lose incentive to work. And, and something similar would, would happen to the rich because the very high marginal rates of taxes, of marginal, the very high marginal tax rate is, would disencourage the rich to be productive. So an incentive problem. The, the, the bucket is leaking because, because there is an incentive, incentive problem. So basically the conclusion is redistributing income is inefficient. So for the pure economist who cares only for with it with efficiency, he would say redistributing income is a bad idea. It reduces, uh, it reduces uh, efficiency. So instead of redistributing income, if we, uh, if we, uh, and this is already beyond Okun, this is not Okun's paper, but this is also part of the conventional wisdom of economy. Instead of redistributing, we should care 
uh, we should look at the uh, possibility of, uh, of uh, having uh, invest investment friendly environments. And this translates in the investment friendly environments, this usually translates into less taxation for capital income. And as you know, in the 80s and 90s, this has been practiced all over the world, reducing the tax rate for high incomes. Second uh, element, with the less taxation of capital income, there, will, there would be resources which can be invested. And this investment can uh, spur innovation, job creation, and income likely will trickle <coughs> down. What is not taken from the rich is then invested, and it, so, so wealth and income will trickle down reaching uh, the, the poor. Of course, trickle down may imply more inequality, but then you are not really a welfare economist if you don't believe that uh, what matters is that the, in spite of inequality, which might be bigger, the condition of the poor might improve in spite of more inequality. And what counts? is the improvement in the condition of, of the poor, in spite of more the fact that there would be more inequality. Did you get that point? The point is, don't, don't worry with inequality. What matters is that the uh, lower, the people well beyond would, would improve somehow. So this is, this is am, am I exaggerating? been in economic courses, uh, am I making a, a caricature to, it's more or less what we, what we receive. Now, what, uh, let us jump to, uh, to the IMF. So the, the title of, of, of this talk is From Maltus to the IMF, so I will reverse, I will now go to the IMF. So this was prepared, by the way, under the effect of the surprise of a paper. It's a working paper by the IMF. Doesn't, uh, it doesn't represent the uh, it doesn't represent the IMF uh, official position. But nonetheless, it's a paper coming from the IMF seven years ago, 2010. And the uh, the basic uh, the basic uh, surprise was that this paper was calling the attention for the fact that the United States, United States had, had experienced two major economic crises over the past century. We know this: the Great Depression in uh, 1929 and the Great Recession in 2007. And the thing is that was there is something in common with those two episodes two crisis episodes. What is in common? In both, both periods, there was, both periods, both crises were preceded by a sharp increase in inequality, both income inequality and wealth inequality. <coughs> and by, by this time, the first databases were, uh, we could consult databases, by the way, Piketty and Science were working on the data be beyond those databases. And in those databases, we could really confirm what this uh, IMF researcher was, was saying. This is the um, top income share, the top 1% income share. And actually, we find in 1929 a peak, the top 1% with 20% uh, of all income. Then we find a long period after the depression where this, uh, where this share has shrunk substantially to 8% until 1976. And after 1976, we find an escalation of the share of income of the top 1% to reach the same level. In fact, to reach in 2011 the, the, same, the same level. Somewhere 2000, 
2007, the kids that were here, how they this So this is, this is the uh, statistical fact which probably awoke this uh, awareness that there might be something connecting uh, income and wealth inequality to economic crisis. We have the surprise effect, we have the data, we look at the data, oh, there's something in common between those two periods. Is there some, uh, something more to this? Is this a coincid coincidence, Simple, simply a coincidence? Moreover, we find similar, similar patterns in uh, other countries. This is the uh, United Kingdom, another Anglo-Saxon type of uh, welfare state. We have a, a, similar, a similar pattern. This is 1929, 2006. Interestingly, the, the pattern is slightly different in France or Sweden. Or Portugal, different in a way. We don't have the data to compare 1929 to, but we have here uh, something that is quite amazing. 1976, a drop until 1981, and then an escalation. After this, Spain, a pattern a bit similar to Portugal. Italy. So, some differences. There is a pattern, but this pattern seems to be more clear in the UK and the United States, which is uh, an interesting uh, indication related to some possible variety of socio-economic configurations in uh, different capitalist countries. So the question is, this is a question posed by, by a number of people. May increasing inequality be a cause of an economic crisis? And it's, it's not just the, the, the IMF researchers. I mentioned that they are claiming that it, uh, indeed it may. There is research by Branko Milanovic, which was a, a researcher from the World Bank. There is Joseph Stiglitz, wrote uh, about it uh, recently. There is uh, Mayan, there is Jean-Paul Fidusi, and there is, of course, uh, Piketty now. And uh, I will go through some quotes of these authors so that we may find some commonalities in the type of analysis. So what, what we find in Stiglitz, 2009, it's the, it's the idea that uh, since the 80s, the capitalist economies, with some differences, some variety, they've experienced stagnating real incomes. So the real incomes of uh, workers' families more or less uh, stagnated uh, since, the, since the 80s up to, up to the 2000s. Those households whose incomes have stagnated became uh, borrowers, became, uh, became uh, borrowers in a, in, a, in a credit system that has developed to, during, during the same period. And this borrowing uh, allowed them to maintain uh, even a rising standard of, of living. So if you look at the United States, it's well known. By borrowing a large number of uh, working class families could uh, buy homes in the 80s and the 90s. The, the, the same uh, happened here in Portugal also. In the period there was, there was, there was talk of uh, democratization of credit positive uh, word, democratization, associated with credit. It's more difficult to pronounce now this uh, phrase, but it was common to refer to this uh, 
massive borrowing as democratization of credit. So stagnation of real incomes, easy access to credit at low rates of interest, uh, well, rising standards of living. Stiglitz adds, is going fast, this borrowing uh, late, uh, root and sustainable, leading to default. The other side of, of the coin. So in, in Ryan, Ryan is a, is, he stresses the political element in this uh, process of credit democratization. He presents credit, credit uh, expansion as a political response to rising inequality. So he, he, he attributes the expansion of credit into a political stance, a political, a political response to rising inequality that came to expand leading the households, especially in the low income ones, lending, to expand lending to households, especially in low income ones. Even low income households have now access to credit. And of course, the benefits of growing consumption, food by credit, or more jobs, benefits, the benefits, growing consumption and more jobs were immediate, whereas paying the inevitable bill could be postponed into the future. And the benefit that proved, once again, unsustainable later on, and it became visible with the crisis. P2C and Saracen, so French, French economists. The starting point, once again, an increase in inequalities which depressed aggregate demand. Or rather, which would have depressed aggregate demand if not for the credit expansion? Which depressed aggregate demand and prompted monetary policy to react it's a little bit different, this mechanism. So the idea is that uh, there was an increase in inequality, depressing aggregate demand, pressing monetary policy to react. So lowering the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, interest rates, lowering interest rates and expanding the monetary base. By maintaining a low level of interest rate, which itself allowed private debt to increase beyond sustainable They are, they are a bit more sophisticated in the sense that they have the other side of the coin. On the other hand, the search for high return investment by those who benefited from the increase in inequalities led to the emergence of bubbles. There was another process. Much of this, uh, much of the part of the effect of the low uh, interest rates and the expansion of uh, the offer of, of the supply of money fed financial bonds, was used to invest in financial assets and fed financial bonds. So net wealth, even families, middle class families had access to credit, uh, which was transformed into financial investment. Net wealth became uh, overvalued, so with this financial, with this investment in financial assets, the consequence was the overvaluation of the assets. And the high asset crisis gave false impression that the high levels of debt were sustainable. So this is a little more detailed in the mechanism. So we had money pouring out of the central banks, low uh, financial assets and, uh, and other assets growing in value. This uh, wealth effect fooling once again the mechanism that led to credit expansion. The false impression that they were, uh, were sustainable. So this, uh, this bubble is giving the impression that high levels of debt were sustainable. The crisis revealed itself and the bubbles uh, exploded. Another 
this description by Kumov and Ranciers. They start by the investors using part of their increased income, and their increased income has to do with high rates of profit, stemming from lower wages. Investors using part of their increased income to purchase additional financial assets backed by loans to workers. By doing so, they allow workers to limit their drop in consumption following their loss of income. But a large and highly persistent rise of workers' debt to income ratios generates financial fragility, which eventually can lead to a financial crisis. So, slightly different interpretations of uh, what went down, what went, of the mechanism linking uh, growing inequality in income to crisis, and the mediation is the financial sector. So we had uh, authors who put the emphasis on, uh, on uh, what, the, uh, in what investors did with their increased profits, and others putting emphasis with uh, what families did once they got access to credit. But in fact, both things are linked. Credit was the, uh, was the bridge between increasing profits and non-satisfied demands by families with lower, with lower income. It worked nicely for both parts, investors and uh, workers' families but it didn't uh, last long. So the general idea is that uh, around this uh, period, 2007, something, uh, something important happened. And, uh, and this was maybe, probably, we are already with the ability to look at the distance in time. Well, the end of a peculiar type of uh, accumulation uh, regime which was uh, characterized by demand, which was sustained by credit, fueled by credit that recycled higher, higher profits. Well, the thing, of course, the, the interesting thing is, at least for me, is that this, in fact, is nothing new. So we find in uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, a book written in 1954 about the Great Depression, which, by the way, is translated into Portuguese. You can find it in the library. It's a small book. The translation is not brilliant, but uh, it's possible to read. And in 1954, John Kenneth Galbraith was writing that uh, the bad distribution of income was the first of five weaknesses which seem to have had especially intimate bearing on the issuing disaster. The issuing disaster was 1939 crisis. So one of five, I don't recall what were the other four, but one of five weaknesses was the uh, bad distribution of income. But even before the Galbraith, uh, we find it in, uh, in the general theory of uh, of course, the style is a bit different, uh, but it states something like this. Our argument, so the argument, one of the main arguments in the general theory, our argument leads towards the conclusion that in contemporary conditions, the growth of wealth grows so far from being dependent, or in other words, the growth of wealth is not dependent <laughs> on the abstinence of the rich, as is commonly supposed, it is more likely to be impeded by it. So the abstinence of the rich, the concentration of income and wealth in the top of the pyramid uh, does, not does not fool growth as it was, co it was the conventionally thought it may, it may hinder it, it may impede, impede growth. And of course, Keynes was a, was a reader of uh, John Austin, one of those economists which is never, 
part of the curriculum that uh, inspired Keynes uh, very much. And also before Keynes was saying that uh, in a whole book, Philosophy of Industry, that's it's called, it, the book is called Philosophy, that's maybe it's, not, it's impossible to find in the library. <coughs> philosophy of uh, industry, he writes that uh, his purpose in this book is to show that uh, an undue exercise of the habit of saving is possible, and that such an undue exercise impoverishes the community. So saving uh, is a bad thing. So undue exercise of the habit of saving impoverishes the community, throws laborers out of work, drives down wages, and spreads that gloom and pro prostration through the commercial world, which is known as the depression in trade. So the cause of the crisis, the depression in trade, which was a term used in the, those times, may be too much saving. Income is going up the social ladder to people who simply don't spend it. It accumulates there. It is not spent neither as investment nor as consumption. It simply accumulates there. There are different forms of accumulating there. You can buy land, you can buy buildings, you can buy financial assets, you can keep the notes and coins, but this is not very advisable as many people are recently discovering, accumulating note, bank notes and coins might be dangerous. But it gets there at the top of the pyramid. It's not invested, neither invested nor, nor uh, spent in uh, consumption. And it leads, to, it leads to disaster. This is very close to the whole point of Keynes in the, uh, in the liquidity preference. Huh? <laughs> this translates in Keynes as liquidity preference. Uh, it's a whole point. Uh, too much, too much saving, not a virtue, a problem. Too much parsimony, not a virtue, a problem, a social, a, a social problem. So, and by the way, we can, we can move a bit further back in time, leading to Karl Marx. And he's very, he's definitely. The ultimate reasons for all real crises, if you want a reason for a crisis, there, there you are, always remains the poverty and restricted consumption of the masses, as opposed to the drive of capitalist production to develop the productive forces, as though only the absolute consuming power of society constituted their limits. Note, it's a bit uh, different, than, uh, it's a bit different, this argument from Hobson's. It's not it's not that wealth is being accumulated at the top and, be, and being left idle there. It's that wealth or capital is being accumulated at the top, calling for, a, for a, some sort of application which might uh, reproduce profits a long time. Well then, a, a, basic, a basic mechanism of capitalism, according to Marx, would, would, would be that that uh, there would be an inner tendency for wealth to accumulate in par with the, in par with the, in par with the, with poverty and restricted consumption by, by, the, by the working people. And this would create a problem for capitalism itself. Wealth being accumulated and invested, or looking for investment, and uh, and working people, which were deprived of an income to consume the potential of the, uh, of the industry. But we, we can continue to move backward. So here we find, uh, we find, uh, we find in the middle of the uh, 19th century an interesting discussion between two friends, which is David Ricardo and, uh, and Malthus, Robert. They were friends, they were exchanging views, they were in agreement most of the time. Both of them, they considered themselves to be disciples of Adam Smith. 
but they had an important disagreement on the point that concerns us. On this point, can inequality generate a crisis? This is the thing. So, David Ricardo was basically telling us that, uh, that the point uh, that later Marx was, uh, and Hobson and Keynes were noticing that uh, there would be, there was the possibility of having an insufficient demand in respect to the uh, potential pr production uh, was an impossible situation. So I noticed the, the, uh, the argument, as Ricardo put it, puts it, is really convince you, convincing. I, I think I will be able to convince you that uh, insufficient demand is uh, an impos impossibility. So look, for instance, let's give uh, 10,000 pounds to a man. Of course, this man, being sane, would not lock it up in a chest. He would not build a treasure. Why? Adam Smith uh, explains why. Because, uh, well, the money being left idle there, robbers might uh, take the, thieves might take the money, but we don't even have to think about thieves. Money being left idle there would simply not grow as, as it would happen if it is uh, uh, productively invested. So 10,000 pounds were given to this man, and he will not, he will not hoard it. The word is in English, is he will not, não, não vai ficar um tesouro, não vai constituir um tesouro com essas. He will not build a treasure with these 10,000 pounds. What, what will he do? He would either increase his expenses by 10,000 pounds. He would spend it simply. Employing it himself productively, can buy materials to build a ship to go to India and bring back some commodities. Or he can lend it to some other person. So he has different, he has different possibilities. He can simply consume the 10,000 pounds. He can, he can uh, use them productively to, you know, to sow a field. Uh, or he can lend it to some other per per person for the first. In either case, the demand will be, will be increased. Look, if he uses it, if he uses the 10,000 pounds as capital, or if he lends those 10,000 pounds, this translates into demand, obviously. If he increases his expenses, his effectual demand might probably be for buildings, furniture, or some other enjoyment. If he employs his 10,000 pounds productively, his effectual demand would be for food, clothing, and raw materials, which might be set, which might set new laborers to work. But still, it would be demand. Are you convinced? If you give 10,000 pounds to anyone, those 10,000 pounds will translate into demand somehow. This is the, this is the famous Say's Law, no? Those who study, uh, how, how the <coughs> says law, how does it translate? Uh, supply creates its own demands. <coughs> so is the, uh, so, and I dare you, show me th that Ricardo might be wrong. Or is this logic, uh, can you find us uh, some kind of, uh, possibility that this is not the case? <coughs> so he's right. So why? Let's no, so finish here. Can, can I go on the computer? The, the, the part of the demand? I don't think on it. So okay. Can the loan be considered uh, also a part of demand? No. If you lend money to somebody, he will have to do, now the situation starts again. I lend you 10,000 pounds. What will you do with 10,000 pounds? You may either consume it yourself, or you may invest it. If you consume it, you are transforming into demand 10,000 pounds. If you are investing, then 
what is for once again in demand. If you are hiring workers, workers with their salary will buy stuff. What about financial markets? What about speculation? Okay. Um, maybe trading, short term trading. Yes. I find an easier situation. Of course, but, but we excluded before. You can just keep the 10,000 pounds under the uh, mattress. Okay, but uh, let's exclude. Okay, it's financial markets. Why? It's, it's demand by financial products, of course, but still it's out of the real economy. So it might be the same thing, financial demand and real demand. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, simply. Well, let's use the, the, the 10,000 pounds we call it investment, okay? But it's not the same thing as hiring people or uh, buying uh, instruments to work, machines. I buy stocks, I buy, <coughs> I buy financial assets. I buy real assets like uh, houses, it might work also. What may happen to the 10,000? Uh, if I buy houses, okay, it, uh, somehow it translates to demand. But if I buy financial assets, what may happen? But what may happen is that, uh, what do they tell us in the basic book? If you're buying stock from a firm, then the firm will have money to invest. And it translates into demand. But there is a, something hot about this. Because if you are buying stock, what might happen is it's that it's the, uh, the value of the uh, financial asset may increase may duplicate, triplicate the value of the financial asset. And this financial asset, which has duplicated of its value, still corresponds to the same, uh, the same part of the capital of the, of the firm. But it's worth twice, because there was a lot of people with 10,000 pounds in their hands which bought, decided to buy those, those assets. Or if you buy land, the same plot of land, can double its value like this, and uh, nothing changes in the property, the produ productive uh, capacity of the land itself. It's the same land, but its value duplicated. So there might be something uh, along those lines. And by the way, that's what those people were telling us before. Those people discussing the mechanism linking inequality to crisis, or at least some of them, they were saying exactly this. Well, income went to the top. And the problem is that since there was a depressed demand, that income which went to the top was, uh, was invested in financial products. And the result was not an expansion of investment, but a, a bubble in the value of the uh, financial assets. So this is part of the mechanism leading to the crisis. I think so. That's what these people were telling us before. But Malthus, he thought differently. Malthus was particularly... I'm sorry, it's not very... From the practical point of view, what Malthus thought about this is not very enlightening. But uh, anyway, it's interesting and, and there might be something to it. What Malthus thought is that... Uh, it has been thought by very able writers, and this, by the way, is interesting. So Malthus was not quoting neither Sen nor uh, Ricardo, his friend. They were very able writers, because in the, 20th, in the 19th century, it was very impolite to refer directly to, to others, especially when criticizing. So you would not, when criticizing, you would not, or even uh, more, even uh, not only when criticizing, so this, uh, these references were unpolite. <laughs> references were very unpolite. So it has been thought by some very able writers that although there may be easily a glut of particular commodities, so a glut is uh, overproduction of particular uh, commodities, so an abundance of particular commodities, there cannot possibly be a glut of commodities in general. This doctrine, however, has generally applied 
appears to me to be utterly unfounded. This is not simply not true and completely to contradict the great principles which regulate supply and demand. So this theory that uh, supply creates its own demand, they cannot be overproduction, it is simply false. It contradicts the great principles which regulate supply and demand. So let me try to explain why. And I have to warn you that this, this, his explanation is not crystal clear. But the general the idea is that if the richer portion, portion of society were to forego their accustomed conveniences and luxuries with a view to accumulation, so what, what, what is he talking about? He's talking about the luxury spending by the rich, the aristocrats. So if the rich, the aristocrats, simply decided to be parsimonious, to be to save a lot. So if they would they would forego their accustomed conveniences and luxuries, they are accustomed to conveniences and luxuries. So if they gave up this habit with a view to accumulation, what is it if, if the aristocracy, if the aristocrats would become bourgeois, that's what he's saying, what he's saying, with a view to accumulation. The only effect would be a direction of nearly the whole capital of the country to the production of necessaries. So if they would give up spending in luxuries, the aristocrats, and if they would become bourgeois who save to invest, the result would be, would be the direction of all this investment to the production of necessaries. And in that case, there would, there would undoubtedly be more necessary produced, necessaries produced that would be sufficient for existing demand. So notice that he's, uh, he's introducing here something which is not uh, very familiar to us, but it was familiar to Adam Smith and to, and to Malcolm, which is the distinction between necessaries, so commodities which are necessary for for our life, for comfort, we would say consumption goods, basically. Necessaries are one thing, other things are conveniences and luxuries. So these are two very different things. The thing is, the aristocrats would give up consuming, spending on, on luxuries. They would, become, they would become bourgeois and start to invest in producing necessaries. To whom would they sell this, those necessaries? Uh, if the uh, if the uh, if the uh, if the workers are underpaid, so basically, no nation can possibly grow rich by an accumulation of capital arising from a permanent diminution of consumption. That's basically the point. Not saying something which which, which translates into, into very up to date uh, up to date remarks which are very common in, the, in those days. So we might think, and once again I would ask you, what what would be the remedy for this situation? Capitals are going to the production of necessaries. Necessaries become overabundant. How would we solve that problem, logically? Why do we use production or how? By reducing Why production? Reduce production or increase consumption. OK, reduce production, not a good idea. The, uh, increase the consumption. The what? Increase consumption. How? Wages. You mean wages. wages. Increasing no. wages. More people with the labor market. Increasing wages is the, uh, the, uh, the logic outcome. So let's hear Malthus about that. It is most desirable that the laboring classes should be well paid. Nice. I'm sorry, I have no. 
is most desirable that the labeling classes should be all paid. This is Robert Malthus, uh, by the way. Uh, if we read Malthus, Montes has some uh, ideas which we have about Malthus, which become a bit. Uh, he was a good man. But as a great increase of consumption among the working classes, must greatly increase the cost of production. You need labor costs. <laughs> so the wage increase in the wage increase in the, of the wages in the labor classes will increase the cost of production. And it must lower profit and diminish, diminish or destroy the multiple fuel combinate. So I'm sorry, I don't know who suggested increasing wages, but if we do it, then uh, profits will be squeezed. If profits are squeezed, investment will suffer. If investment suffers, more, less jobs, less jobs, uh, aggravating the problem. So, no way. What then? We have a problem. On the one hand, what, this is the, uh, the, the, those, you know, those political economists of the 19th century, they, they, they thought in terms of social classes. The, the social classes of Malthus are master producers, so the bourgeoisie. The workers are worker producers. They're all producers, but ones are masters, the others are workers. So master producers, and then we have the aristocrats, which are not this picture here. Aristocrats, master producers, the, the, the uh, worker producers. On the one hand, master producers save too much. So this is the virtue of the bourgeoisie, saving and transforming savings into investment. Worker producers consume too little. This is no vice of the working class. They simply have low wages. This is the, but increasing the salary of worker producers would impede profit. So we have this contradiction, but increasing the salary of worker producers would impede profits and the growth of so what would we do, logically, once again? Strange logic, but uh, logic anyway. We would increase the consumption of conveniences and luxuries of the rich. We would increase the consumption of uh, conveniences and luxuries of the aristocracy. How would it work? Well, we have to go back to Adam Smith. So Adam Smith, if you remember well, a distinction between uh, productive and unproductive labor, workers' labor. What was productive labor was labor used to produce necessities. What was product unproductive labor, basically uh, the metaphor was, uh, well, the servants working for a salary for the, uh, for the aristocracy waiters, servants in general. They were working, but they were not producing commodities. While the other productive workers were working, but producing commod marketable commodities. This was lost in economic thought, this difference between productive and productive, and productive labor. But it was operational for, for, uh, for uh, Malthus theory. Well, because product, unproductive laborers, they got a salary, they produced nothing marketable, no necessary necessities or necessaries, but they were consumers anyway. That salary would translate into cons consumption. So, the conclusion is, if we, if we it is quite strange that the political economist of the 19th century is building in a whole argument in favor of the uh, status of the aristocracy. That it is. And it, there is something uh, that, we might, uh, that we might take which might be enlightening in respect to 20th century capitalism. Because if we look at 20th century capitalism with the categories of productive and productive life, and why did, actually, why did we drop those, these, those categories? Well, it is a fact that uh, some 
labor is devoted to the production of goods and services that are provided to the, the market, while other labor uh, leads to the production of uh, useful things uh, which are not provided in the market. So if we look at 20th century capitalism anyway, with those categories, the question is, do those categories still make any sense? We undoubtedly found an expansion of uh, unproductive labor in respect to productive labor. If we look at the 20th century capitalism, welfare capitalism in the 20th century, we observe an expansion of services which are provided to people, but not sold to people in the market. And these are the services provided by the welfare state to people. So we really found an expansion of uh, unproductive in the, uh, in the uh, Smithian and Marxian sense labor in what we call the welfare state. So we don't have any more in the welfare capitalism of the 20th century to use the category of, uh, of uh, Malthus. It's not the aristocrats which have to s spend on luxuries and uh, other use useless and, uh, other stuff. It's the, uh, it's the it's some services which have to be provided outside of the market to people and services which are paid with part of the income, mainly f with progressive taxes, with part of income of the rich and provided to everybody without the market in between. So, but this is just just the possibility that uh, this uh, category is used by Malthus might be somehow, somehow useful for interpreting uh, uh, what's uh, going on. So, and by the way, if we look into the crisis, what, what might happen is, in respect to taxes, who are supporting this uh, welfare state, we observed lowering the rates and we also observe at the same time the shrinking of the services which are provided by the, by the, uh, by the, uh, by the state. So the thing, the thing is, uh, can inequality be a cause of an economic crisis? I think my point here is not yes or no. My point is, uh, simply not a new idea. It's an idea which has been around. <coughs> it's, uh, in fact, it's a recurrent theme, theme in economic thought. A theme that uh, comes and goes correlated with the, uh, the, the pulsing of capitalism itself. There is somehow uh, a link between the dynamics of capitalism itself and the dynamics of economic ideas. And I think this is the case with the, uh, with the idea of uh, the possibility of uh, inequality being a cause of the crisis. So what happened to us, those of us who simply have been educated recently in economics, what happened is that we simply forgot or were made to forget a number of ideas which were there in the past, which were clear for uh, dead economists, and which were replaced by this uh, simplistic idea of a leaking bucket that transports water from the rich to the poor, leading to less efficiency. So this type of idea, the, leaky bu the leaking bucket idea, simply obfuscated knowledge that was there. We knew about those things. Those things were there. And we are very surprised now and, ta and take as novelties things like Piketty's book. It has long periods. It's not uh, a, new, a new item. So 
So what do we have? We have one interesting thing. Inequality may be an impediment to capital accumulation. So if the, uh, if the uh, purpose is to accumulate capital, then inequality may impede it. And this uh, might translate into the idea by Michael, Skales Michael Kalensky, an economist who was both a Keynesian and a Marxist, which is something which is possible. Uh, and he called, and he referred to this by, by the idea that captains of industry would benefit from less inequality. Captains of industry would benefit objectively from with less inequality. So how can they oppose moves to shift society into a more equal pattern of uh, income distribution? Does it make sense? Well, it's good for the accumulation of capital that's, that the income is better distributed. And still they oppose it. How come? How come? It has to do with the second point, which makes it clear. But inequality is also a precondition for capital accumulation. And he explains. Discipline in the factories and political stability are more appreciated than profits by business leaders. So what, what has inequality to do with uh, discipline in the factories and political stability? Now, if really you are inclined to accept any job if your income is nil. You are inclined to be disciplined and not engage in uh, political adventures if your income is close to zero. So we have this contradiction between uh, an impediment to capital accumulation, which at the same time is a precondition for capital accumulation. In the end, I don't know if this is a feature, a permanent feature of capitalism or not, but it has been so far. In the end, the discipline in the factories and political stability are more appreciated than profits by business leaders. So inequality will be cultivated as a disciplinary mechanism and as, uh, and as a political stability.